I'd like to introduce the first uh, panel discussion today, uh, Combining Naval Forces for Joint Operations and for Fighting a United War. Uh, many of the, some of the questions that were just fielded by Admiral Miller uh, have to do with combined operations, so this is a very uh, uh, fitting um, uh, panel at this time. I'd like to invite uh, Rear Admiral Jim Loblein. Uh, he is the Deputy Director of the U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, who is the moderator to come up with his panel. Please take the panel chairs over here. There's no specific order, and the panel uh, will please introduce themselves. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, I am Jim Loblein, the uh, Deputy uh, Commander for uh, Vice Admiral Miller, who just gave that, uh, that speech. What we're going to talk about, I thought what Admiral Miller brought out was a perfect lead-in to talking about combined joint operations in the maritime environment. And a lot of the questions that was just brought up here at the last minute uh, for Admiral Miller kind of leads directly into what this panel is about. But we've got some distinguished people on the panel. I want to take a minute just to introduce uh, uh, them for you. First, we've got uh, Rear Admiral uh, von Maltzen from Germany. He has uh, joined the German Navy in 1973. He sp spent his whole career doing ships and commanding at various levels, including fast patrol boat flotilla. He was the squadron commander for destroyer and frigate squadron number one. Chief of Staff of the German Fleet Command and Deputy Director of Ops of the German Navy Headquarters. And he currently is the commander of the Standing NATO Maritime Group 1 in Operation Active Endeavor. And I'll let him share a little bit about uh, that in his remarks as well. Secondly, we have Rear Admiral uh, Matt Parr uh, from the UK Navy. He commanded uh, the USS or the HMS Trafalgar a submarine. Sorry about that. Uh, he also commanded a surface ship, the Type 23 frigate HMS Montrose. He, as Commodore, he commanded the British forces in Gibraltar. And he was also, in 2011, uh, assigned as the Assistant Chief of Navy Staff in the Ministry of Defense. And currently, he's the commander of all operations for the Royal Navy throughout the globe. So quite a, uh, a vast uh, area of responsibility. And finally, we've got uh, Commodore... Um, Lee Petty. Captain Petty is a U.S. Coast Guard Navy captain. Um, he served uh, on various ships. He's commanded three different Coast Guard cutters, the Padre, the Shamal, a 129-foot uh, PC, Navy PC uh, craft, and he also commanded the U.S. Coast Guard uh, Cutter Dependable, which is a 210-foot medium endurance cutter. He is currently signed as Commander of Patrol Forces Southwest Asia. And what that basically means is he's in charge of all the U.S. Coast Guards in this area of the world. And uh, another big area of responsibility. So we've got a great distinguished group here. I'll kick this off before we ask a couple questions specifically for the panelists. And that is to discuss um, what this whole discussion of combining Navy forces and joint operations. I think it's important that we kind of talk you, you can talk in a lot of different areas, but to create a framework. And I, and I just pose as a framework as we talk about what each of our different navies and Coast Guard are bringing to this. I like to look at the framework in terms of three, three areas. Number one is capability, capacity, and interoperability. For capacity, Admiral Miller talked about presence. And talking about presence, whether it's in the Balao Mendeb Straits or how things have been pretty... Uh, pretty comfortable in the Arabian Gulf because of presence. You know, presence is ships, it's aircraft, it's also platforms, and presence counts. We all in this room know that. The second thing is capabilities. Now, this room's full of, of uh, uniform folks, and it's also filled with industry. Capability is being able to take that presence, but be able to count on it. It's the weapon systems, et cetera. You know, that, that capability has got to work. Uh, we pulled in the USS Arleigh Burke into Abu Dhabi about a year ago at the uh, International Air and Missile Defense Conference, and they have a quote from the old U.S. from Arleigh Burke, Admiral Arleigh Burke, who's an uh, admiral, a famous admiral in the U.S. Navy, and on his quarterdeck, the quote on that ship was, this ship was built to fight. You better know how. 
and it was to his ship's crew. And it kind of gets into the human factors. Not only do your weapon systems, et cetera, have to work, but it's the people that make up those forces that have got to know what they're doing to make sure it's credible. So presence and then capability is credible. And then the third thing was the last question was brought out is interoperability. How do we take all of this presence and capability, but how do we coordinate it together so that within a combined operation construct or a joint operation construct, we get the most bang for the buck, so to speak? How do we get the most out of those forces? So I, I just pose that as a framework as our panelists uh, go through and, and go through those different questions. So I'll kick off the first one with uh, Admiral Maltzen here. Uh, the German Navy's presence in the Indian Ocean and in the Arabian Sea has been a continuous effort, especially with your operations at Atlanta. Uh, what, German, what are Germans, Germany's motives and intentions for this engagement, and where do you see the, the present and the future um, effort of the German Navy in this area of the world? <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Well, German, Germany or German Navy is, is if you if, if, if you like, quite new in the area. We arrived first here after 9-11 in, in 2002 when participating in Operation Enduring Freedom at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we continued with the Operation uh, Atalanta, the uh, European Union naval operation uh, to counter piracy. So the motivation, I guess, for, the Germ for Germany and German Navy to be here is, is to... Uh, to, to stabilize the area. Um, a, a, a former German defense minister once said, uh, well, the security of Germany is, all, is also defended at the Hindukush area. That was an expression that people discuss quite a lot in Germany, but especially from the Navy perspective, I think it's, it's, it's quite true because um, we depend, and Admiral Miller pointed this one out, we depend on, on secure sea lines of communications. And I think the, the, the piracy, piracy um, uh, threat in, in, in this area was high, and that was the reason why, why we came here with Atalanta. Well, everybody knows we can, we can fight piracy at sea, but uh, we can't defeat piracy at sea. Uh, piracy, the basis on, of piracy is, is ashore, it's the conditions ashore that, that bring people to, uh, to act as pirates. So we have to stabilize the area. And in that respect, the European Union has two different missions of operations beside uh, Atalanta. That is the, the, the uh, training mission, Somalia, and it's the Oikap Nestor, so to, to stabilize the area. And, 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 and this is, I guess, the motivation for Germany to participate in that European effort, which is, in fact, a worldwide effort, I guess. But uh, from, from our point of view, it's if you, or from our, our, our um, engagement is on the European side, um, is to, 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 uh, to help uh, bring stability to the area. Because only once we have stability and uh, in the area ashore, then we have a, a, a secure sea line of communication. What we have now with the, with the piracy going down considerably in numbers, and, and since, since months there was no, no real piracy act in the area. But that is because um, the navies are there, that is because the merchant navy navies um, uh, adopted their behavior. Uh, but from, from my point of view, piracy is suppressed, but is not defeated. Uh, so, and we must do that, and that is, our, is Germany's contribution to that, uh, to that uh, affair. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Admiral Parr, um, recently we've seen a lot of headlines coming out of uh, the UK about this area, specifically from a Navy perspective. Um, let's talk about the Queen Elizabeth. Um, a lot about um, coming out with a new aircraft carrier, where do you see that aircraft carrier being used, how it's going to be used in a joint ops environment, and do you expect to bring it here to the Arabian Gulf? Uh, well, we've got to be a little bit patient still. Uh, it's an enormous enterprise for the UK uh, to reintroduce large-scale fixed-wing aviation. But I think it's a sign both of the Navy's ambition 
uh, and of also the government's commitment to maritime forces, that it's a project that we're well underway with. Uh, the first ship is launched, as you know. The government announced at a NATO summit last year that they expect us to run both of the class. So there'll always be one uh, at very high readiness. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that the government, having spent a big chunk of the defence budget mm -hmm. on naval fixed-wing aviation, uh, expects to see a return on that investment. So that return will be that the carrier, I think, will be expected to be at sea a lot. Uh, and when you start speculating about where it will spend its time, uh, I think we can only go on the evidence we have at the moment. Uh, so at the moment, the Royal Navy has typically uh, well, has a major commitment to this region. We typically have 10 or 11 naval vessels at sea uh, in this region. Uh, we have a number of small marine training teams. We have two aircraft attachments. And of course, we have naval headquarters in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. uh, and our commander, who we're now calling the Senior Naval Officer Middle East, uh, will be talking on a panel this afternoon. So our commitment to the Gulf is enduring. Uh, it's, going to be, uh, it's going to be changed when the aircraft carrier comes in. And of course, a key feature for us in planning how we can operate the aircraft carrier uh, is its interoperability with other partner nations. Uh, and many of the decisions about the way we procured it, the types of aircraft we procured, the type of operating patterns we will have, uh, were taken absolutely fundamentally so that we would be able to fit in uh, with mm -hmm. the allies we were most likely to be operating with. Uh, so that's an important point. Um, I just wanted to touch on the, 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 the three things you, uh, you talked about. I've mentioned the persistence. I've mentioned the, uh, the enduring commitment that we have to mm -hmm. this region. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second thing you talked about was capability. And I think it would also be fair to say that the ships that we send to the Gulf are, are the ones that we put through the highest uh, intensity training, the most rigorous preparation in terms of equipment, in terms of personnel training. We see this theatre as the yardstick. Uh, if you're going to get ready to, to meet what Ali Burke said, um, then this is a key high-profile theatre. I'm not saying we see it as particularly volatile at any one stage. I don't say we, we feel particularly threatened. But it's absolutely right that if we're going to have high standards, this is a theatre where we impose them. Um, and lastly, I just don't think we should beat ourselves up too much about interoperability. Actually, we're not bad. Of course, there are things we can improve, and it's mostly about sharing of information. Uh, and it's absolutely right that we do all we can to improve them. Uh, but sometimes we need to stand back and recognise that, that, that we're better than sometimes we recognise. Uh, we had an operation last year uh, that you'll be aware of just outside this theatre uh, in the eastern Mediterranean to recover uh, equipment, uh, chemical weapons equipment from Syria. Uh, and the civilian ships that brought the equipment out uh, had two task groups escorting them. To the north of the line they came out was a task group uh, based on NATO, mm -hmm. uh, commanded by a Danish, rather excellent Danish one-star command team. Uh, and it was mostly filled with NATO nations that don't necessarily operate all, all that often together, uh, but clearly using NATO techniques worked perfectly well. To the southern half of that line uh, was a, another task force composed of two much larger nations uh, with a significant maritime presence, uh, but which don't routinely operate with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and the contrast between uh, what was happening north of the line in terms of cooperation mm -hmm. and what happening south of the line uh, was stark. And we in the Gulf, in coalition maritime forces, are much more like the former than the latter. Everything's not perfect, uh, but we are much, much better than we could be. Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Captain Petty here for a little bit. Let's, let's get a Coast Guard view. Uh, Commodore, can you just tell the group here real quick, what is the U.S. Coast Guard presence, how does that fit in the, the, the overall Navy joint fight, so to speak? How do they incorporate within the U.S. forces, and in, in the broader terms, how do they operate within the coalition and in this, uh, the Navy uh, threats that come our way? Sure. 
Yeah, Coast Guard's a force provider to uh, to the U.S. Navy's uh, Fifth Fleet and uh, and, and NAVSENT. Um, we have uh, Coast Guard patrol boats, uh, advanced interdiction teams, and uh, a Middle East training team uh, that are fully integrated while still at the same time uh, maintaining their autonomy as a, uh, as a separate service. <clears throat> as a naval augmentation force, we can, uh, utilize, we can be utilized for naval warfare missions. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, serving the same as if we were, uh, we were, we were Gray Hall with, uh, with, with no orange stripe. Um, alternately, the Navy can leverage our, our unique and complementary uh, skill sets as a, as a maritime, multi-mission, uh, military Coast Guard with competencies and authorities that, uh, that the Navy may not have. In either role, uh, we serve the similar goal of enhancing theater security cooperation uh, and bolstering uh, maritime safety and security in the region. Mm -hmm. This is uh, it's not, a, it's not a new relationship, um, and nor, is it, uh, nor is it one that's based on happenstance. Um, it's uh, grounded in, in really a, a very rich history um, and uh, deliberate planning and, uh, and cooperation. Um, in fact, since the earliest days of the Republic, uh, the Coast Guard has been working alongside uh, the United States Navy. Um, we do this to, to support uh, each other's missions, safeguard our, our nation's security, um, citizens' interests and allies uh, wherever needed. Um, at the strategic level, we have a, both a national fleet policy as well as a national, national fleet plan that, mm -hmm. uh, that guide these, uh, these efforts. It's uh, focused. Uh, akin to what we've we've been discussing a little bit uh, here this morning on both commonality and uh, and interoperability, um, and our national fleet uh, enables uh, our Navy and Coast Guard forces to to operate uh, effectively and uh, and efficiently when called upon. Well, I appreciate that. You know, it's Admiral Miller made the comment in his speech and then his questions at and answers afterwards, where he made the comment that that things are going pretty well in the maritime environment today, despite the efforts that we're doing uh, against ISIL and Daesh up in Iraq and Syria and the contributions that our Navy services are making, um, the presence that we have provided throughout the Arabian Gulf and, in, and throughout the AOR that we have here through our three major stroke, uh, choke points, uh, Bala al Mindeb, the Straits of Hormuz, obviously, and the Suez, um, there's an advantage that we as Navy professionals can take advantage of that other services don't have. And what I mean is we ex exercise and operate together quite a bit, and we need to take full advantage and, and take credit for that. What do I mean by that? If you look at all our counterparts in the Air Force and the Army, et cetera, it's a lot more challenging to get countries to come in and do exercises and multilateral exercises together. You've got visas, you've got air clearances, you've got all this thing, all these other uh, constraints that makes it very difficult to bring in forces and do lots of training. We do make it work, but it is challenging. We take for granted sometimes in the maritime environment, we can do that in international waters and we do it all the time. And I think that's one of the advantages that we in the maritime fight have that ability to do. Perfect example is we just completed the international mine countermeasure exercise uh, this year over 40 nations from six different continents participated in that multi-mission exercise to go after the threat of mines as well as uh, maritime infrastructure protection and what we talked about, the sea lines of communications. Along those lines, uh, Admiral, what, where do you sense uh, in the current budget environment, which is, is quite frankly a new threat to all of us, is how do we continue with this presence? How do we continue providing this presence and capability in a budget-constrained environment? What is, I think you just recently had the White Book published? Are we about to do yeah. About to. How, where do you sense Germany um, taking that, those, some of those budget challenges, and how's that going to affect uh, what you do out in this AOR? Yeah. Well, the, the, I think... We are more or less all in, in a very comparable situation. You know. uh, on the one hand, uh, the defense budgets are cut down. Um, on the other hand, we see the, uh, the, political, the overall political situation uh, is as it is today and how it became today. And, and especially the last couple of months showed us that, um, that perhaps 
the idea of, of having a, a, a peace dividend is, is no, not, no, no longer the, the, the right way. Um, one of the reasons my government decided to, to, to bring out a new white book is not, uh, or the main reason is not because the, the last one is, 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 is from 2006, so it, it, it's old. Now, I think uh, the, the actual situation uh, brings us to the, to, the, to the idea to have, uh, we see the necessity to have a new white book because things have changed in Europe. And if you look at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the NATO summit in Wales last year, where we came up with the, uh, with the uh, action plan, uh, if you see the discussions uh, in NATO right now, transforming NRF and the, the NATO response force to something new to perhaps a very high readiness joint task force, well, that, that all shows that the, the situation is changing, the political situation is changing, and, and there is a need to, um, to, uh, to ad adopt oneself's position. So having said this, and having said that the defense budget is, 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 is cut down more or less everywhere in the place, so we need to find ways how to, to, um, to come along with that situation. And, uh, and, and more than ever, and I'm really convinced in this, uh, it is cooperation with partners, not only with allies, but also with partners. And, uh, and, and bringing the strengths of as many as nations and navies as possible together. And, and what we see here in, in, in the... Uh, in, in the AOR of the Fifth Fleet, you know, if we, what we see in, in the Indic, what we see uh, around the Corn of Africa, how cooperation is being done between the, the, the task forces of, the, of NATO, of, of, uh, of CMF, of, uh, of Atalanta from the European side, but also, and that is even more important, how people how the, the naval forces cooperate with the Indian Navy, with the Chinese Navy, and there were even, well, it's over now, but there were even cooperation with the Russians and many others. That, I think, is, is, is something that we really take as an example how we, how we, we should um, uh, operate in the future. It is coordination and cooperation. Uh, and no nation alone, besides the U.S. Navy perhaps, is, is able really to, 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 to fulfill full skies op uh, operations alone. So we need to come together and to operate together. Thank you. That's great. We just heard uh, Admiral Miller mentioned, and um, it's been announced that the GCC will create a new task force called Task Force 81, which will be essentially inside the Arabian Gulf and, and around that will be a GCC-only task force, Navy task force, that will help handle maritime security operations in the Gulf. And we've had great experience with Task Force 152 and the Combined Maritime Forces. Uh, for Admiral Parr, we're, you made the announcement that uh, the UK will uh, open up their new headquarters, you, even though you've been around for years and years and we've enjoyed that relationship. Was there a strategic messaging behind the reopening with the government of Bahrain? And, and if so, what kind of lessons learned have we learned through our combined maritime forces that we could possibly share with uh, Task Force 81 for well, future success? Well, I think it is, it is great news and, uh, and very exciting. Um, uh, we're going to call the new base in Bahrain uh, HMS Jaffair. Uh, it's mm. an old name. It's been around for many years. Uh, I think we closed it. Uh, as we withdrew officially from the Gulf uh, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So it will be great to see the flag run up again. Um, although we officially withdrew in the 60s, uh, or I think it's in 1972, the policy changed. Actually, of course, we've been here with an enduring presence in, uh, at some strength ever since. Uh, but the criticism of British foreign policy, and I think it's not just from the UK, but it's from many of the... Uh, many of the European nations and other nations that operate here 
uh, is that although we've been here at Strength for 40 years, we've never had a policy that lasted 40 years. We've had 40 different policies, each of which lasted <laughs> one year. Right. Uh, it's a common criticism. And I think the moment that we run that flag up and re-establish a naval presence on a more permanent basis and a slightly more symbolic basis uh, in Bahrain uh, does try to, to, to do away with that period of, of short-term decision-making and make the significant point that we're here for the long term. Um, I think the uh, Task Force 81 is a fantastic idea. Uh, it's a brilliant development. Um, I think one of the lessons that we have learned about being here uh, is that much of our thinking uh, has been relatively short-term in the way we've procured equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have we operate here ships uh, that were designed for operations in a completely different theory of the world. Uh, we send ships here who are specifically designed to operate in a range of water temperatures that this Gulf, uh, that the Gulf doesn't have. Uh, and therefore we're operating them outside their design specification, which means they break a little bit more often, which means we have to modify them, which means they're hard work. Uh, and I think one of the lessons uh, that we've learned as a result of that and that we're absolutely determined not to make in the past uh, is that if we're going to operate worldwide and particularly in the kind of conditions we have here, then design, operation, uh, capability has to be inherently much more flexible than we've seen in the past. That's great. Uh, last question for you, uh, Captain Lee. Where, where do you sense your relationship with other uh, countries within this region from a Coast Guard perspective, what areas do you see that, uh, that you, could, you could foresee being more profitable and in, in increasing their capability or capacity uh, from a Coast Guard perspective and what you've learned back from the United States uh, Coast Guard and what you can provide to them here? Sure. Um, I think uh, you know our, our forces have been here since uh, uh, this upcoming summer is going to mark uh, the 25th year, um, okay. and and they range from um, 25 years ago we had uh, law enforcement detachments de deployed to the theater at that time conducting uh, UN security uh, sanctions and, and and operating in a in a uh, with 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 other countries here in the region and that that grew to patrol boats that uh, operate uh, here in. Uh, in, in the region, both uh, um, oftentimes, oftentimes working for uh, um, CTF uh, 152 and most recently 150. All of those provide us with uh, different touch points for uh, operating with other um, navies in the region as well as other Coast Guards. Um, the Coast Guard also has a, 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 a group that's uh, currently uh, working in the, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on uh, helping to establish a maritime uh, infrastructure force protection um, uh, force. Um, we've worked extensively with uh, coalition uh, naval forces, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we also kind of provide a, a little bit of a unique bent in our uh, our ability to engage with other other coast guards in the region. And uh, we are uh, in, in, in concert in concert with uh, with the Fifth Fleet um, often pursue engagement. Uh, uh, deliberate engagement activities with various countries, be it the uh, United Arab Emirates, or be it uh, the Kuwait Coast Guard, um, or uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And uh, a lot of takeaways, a lot of takeaways, whether it be uh, um, those um, specific to uh, small service combatants, right. um, our patrol boats, whether it be uh, competencies, uh, competencies associated with, with counter smuggling, uh, born in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the form of uh, visit boards search and, and seizure related uh, skill sets. Uh, we operate a, a ship in the box uh, facility. It's, uh, it's, it's really rather unique to the region um, in, uh, in Bahrain where uh, we bring forces from, uh, from throughout the region. Uh, over, the last, over the last four years we've probably seen uh, a little over 2,300 uh, um, participants from, from over 14 nations in the region pass through our ship in the box facility. All of those touch points uh, uh, give, uh, uh, give an opportunity for a variety of, of takeaways that, again, the common theme, a common theme of uh, helping to, uh, to build uh, the maritime security and safety in the region, as well as to uh, leverage some of our, uh, our, our more unique skill sets uh, that uh, we bring uh, to, uh, uh, to the forces operating here. Thanks, Lee. I appreciate that. 
Uh, I want to thank the UAE uh, for allowing us to have this conference here and, and put, this, put this on. I, I think the last thing I want to leave for us in this session is um, to think about the advances we have made in combined Navy forces here. Uh, don't kid yourself. What we do here is unique, okay, in this AOR, in this region of the world. Our forces, specifically the, the U.S. Navy forces, we send a lot of ships, and they come out here prepared, and we do more exercises in this area of the world than anywhere else. And if you see, the Combined Maritime Forces is a unique organization. It does not exist anywhere else in the world but here. And you see the 30 nations that are not just this continent, it's from all over, because we find the strategic importance of what's going on here. But because it's strategically important to us in the maritime environment, we put the forces, we put the capability, and we put the people here to meet that threat. And I think that's something that we can say that we've done pretty well. Do we need to focus in the, in the future for future asymmetric threats, et cetera? Of course. But I think it's what allowed us to, to answer the call to Iraq and Syria as well as we did just by the cooperation of events just like this have done. So I want to thank uh, the Navy League. Thank you for uh, uh, endorsing this part of the, uh, the uh, um, uh, conference here for us. I want to thank our panelists for coming from literally all parts of the globe. Thanks for coming in. I appreciate that. And it's been a pleasure uh, to support this panel. Thank you.